this is a sermon that I've preached once or twice before, and it, and it actually it was a request by my dear wife that I, that I bring it today. Um, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, Easter is the most important and oldest of the festivals of the children of the Christian church commemorating the resurrection of Christ and observed annually on the Sunday which follows the first full moon after the vernal equinox. Okay? The first Sunday following the first full moon after the vernal equinox. Now, this, this study is not intended to illustrate all of the pagan traditions that are adopted by so many Christian churches. So, those are pretty obvious, especially when it comes to, to Easter. Um, the fact that the date of the holiday moves around from year to year based on the full moon after the equinox, when we precisely know <clears throat> what day Jesus Christ died, we know the date. It was the 14th day of Nisan, according to the Jewish calendar. We, know what, we don't know what day he was born, but we know what day he died, and that day doesn't fluctuate on a calendar. It doesn't move around based on a full moon. It's not how that works. My birthday is October 27th. I'm not going to tell you what year, but that's my birthday. And you know what? Every, every year, my birthday is on October 27th. My parents didn't decide, oh, the full moon happened on this day, so therefore, this year your birthday is on November 6th. That's not how it works. It's on a calendar. We know what day Jesus Christ died. We know what day he rose again. These are fixed points on a calendar. And yet, this holiday, they move it around all over the place. I find that kind of interesting that the one, the one time we know the date, they don't use it. They come up with some pagan nonsense. The one date that we don't know, well, they, they label one and come up with a bunch of pagan nonsense. Okay? <clears throat> you think bunnies and eggs, those are two symbols of fertility that have been passed down by the fertility cults. So what I, want to, what I want to talk about today is that day that he died and the day that he rose again. Um, and I want to think about how the true position rubs up against probably 99% of churches calling themselves Christian today. And I'll tell you something, folks, this isn't anything new. What I'm saying today is not anything new. I heard this when I was five years old in a missionary Baptist church. They used to teach exactly the same thing. Don't know what they teach now, but this, they used to teach this same position way back then. Now let's think about some of the facts about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Common teaching is that Jesus was crucified on Good Friday that he died Friday afternoon, that he was laid in the tomb shortly before sundown on Friday. Uh, his body was hurriedly prepared because the Sabbath was approaching, and everybody knows the Sabbath starts at sundown on Friday, right? Um, and further, that he rose from the dead at sunrise on Sunday morning, hence the reason for Sunday sunrise service, Easter sunrise services. Have you ever noticed, you know, what, you know what direction you have to face to watch the sun come up? You have to face the east. The opposite direction of worshiping God. God commands that you face the west. And yet, you have to face the east to watch the sun come up. I, I remember Wendy and I were in Tulum, I think it was Tulum, Mexico one year, years and years ago, looking at the Mayan ruins. Now, 
these Mayan ruins were ruins by the time that white man ever got there. They were already ruins. These people had been wiped out by the Aztecs years and years and years and years before the Spanish or whoever it was showed up teaching Catholicism, right, to, to, to convert the heathens uh, along the, the Yucatan Peninsula. So they discover these ruins. They've, they're, they're, they've been ruins forever. Might as well be forever. I don't know how long, but, but there weren't any people there. They were long gone. Um, and in the temple, they have, there, there was a temple there where they would set their idol, kind of like if you ever saw the Indiana Jones movies, it's that sort of a thing where they would put their idol in the temple. And on one day of the year, which would coincide with the first Sunday following the first full moon after the vernal equinox. It sound, sound familiar to you? In other words, when the sun came up this morning, it would be in such a position that it would shine a light on a little hole in the back of that temple and it would light up that idol. And they, these people, Catholics didn't teach them this. Who do you suppose taught them that? They, they worshiped exactly the same way. Their gods were designed based on the same pagan calendar. Um, so this is a common teaching. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21, Paul says to prove all things, to hold fast that which is good. It's our job to prove things. So I want to I prove this. Is this factual? Is the common teaching factual? Is that really what happened? Was Christ crucified on a Friday, laid in the grave Friday at sundown, and rose again Sunday morning? Are they teaching what is factual, or are they teaching something else? I think it's a worthwhile question, and I intend to show you this morning what the truth is concerning this. You know, now I know that there are some that, in fact, probably many that would say, well, who cares? What difference does it make? What difference does it make? We, you know, we, we all worship the same God, so what difference does it make? It makes a lot of difference, folks. It really makes a lot of difference. Jesus was talking to a Samaritan woman at a well one time. The Samaritans were a people that had moved into the northern area of Israel um, about 150 years before Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. Uh, I think it was Sennacherib, the Assyrian, had come through and destroyed the 10 northern tribes and, take, and dispersed them. Basically, they, he didn't really take them into captivity. He just ran them off, ran them off the land. So now you got this vacant land out there that's got a bunch of buildings on it and stuff. Somebody's going to move into it, and the people who moved into it were the Samaritans. Okay? Samaritans were Gentiles. They were not Jews. And, but they had what they called the Samaritan Pentateuch, which was the first five books of Moses in Samaritan, okay? And they believed that they were worshiping the God of heaven. After all, they had Moses. That's all they had, but they had Moses. So they believed that their worship was to the God of heaven. Now, Jesus Christ is talking to this woman at the well. And over in John chapter 4 and verse 22, he says, ye worship, ye know not what? Not who? Ye worship, you know not what? Clearly you're not worshiping the God of heaven. What are you worshiping? We'll get to that in just a minute. He goes on into the next verse, in verse 23, and he says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. 
If you're going to worship the God of heaven, you've got to worship him in spirit and in truth. You need to know truth. You don't worship him in lies. You don't worship him in falsehood. Um, so if you're not worshiping in spirit and truth, then like the Samaritan woman at the well, you may not realize exactly what it is that you are worshiping. It's not Jesus Christ, and it's not the God of heaven. You might be worshiping Jesus Christ in your mind, and on the other hand, you might be worshiping the devil, because that's the what that the Samaritans were worshiping. And you want to be careful. You don't want to end up worshiping Satan and not real. You know, a lot of people have this idea that, that Satan worshipers are people that cut themselves and scream and howl and run around naked and do all kinds of, and there's some of those. But you know what's more scary than that? Satan worshipers that stand in a pulpit on a Sunday morning and claim to be preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. That's even worse. And there's a bunch of them out there. A bunch. Now, Satan is at war against Jesus Christ. He wants to deny his gospel by any and every means possible. I want you to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. Second Corinthians 11, verses 3 and 4, where Paul says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Paul was afraid that after he started this church in Corinth, that someone was coming in and preaching another Jesus with another gospel and another spirit. He was afraid these Corinthians were going to follow after him and jettison the Jesus that he'd been preaching. So he was warning them against it. Now, in Greek, there are two words, two Greek words that are translated another in the New Testament, okay? We have one word, it's called another. They have two words that we translate another. Um, one of them is a loss, which is another of the same kind. And the other word is a tross, which is another of a different kind, okay? I have a blue Chevy Silverado pickup truck sitting out there that I drive, right? Now, if I decide it's time to get rid of it and go get another car, I guess I could drive to Stingray Chevrolet and I could look for another blue 2019 Chevrolet Silverado that's just like the one I've got. That would be a loss. It's another one, but it's exactly the same thing. Or at least it appears to be the same thing. It's not the same. It probably has more miles on it or whatever. But they look the same, right? So if, if, if Wendy went to the store to buy fruit, and I told her to get another, and she had an apple in her hand, she grabs another apple, that's a loss. But what if she grabs an orange? That's another of a different kind, right? What if I go to the car lot and buy a white Ford F-150? Still a truck, but it's a different truck. That's a tross, okay? That's the point that I'm trying to make here. So with those two Greek words in mind, and I don't want to bore you with the Greekifying here, in this passage, another Jesus is another Jesus of the same kind. In other words, he's intended 
to look like the Jesus of the Bible. Right? Another spirit is another spirit of a different kind. We're not even trying to keep this one hidden. This one has a different, this one doesn't have the Holy Spirit. This one has an unholy spirit. Another gospel is another gospel of a different kind. Our gospel teaches salvation by grace. Their gospel teaches salvation by human works. It's a gospel of a different kind. Okay? And I want you to flip over to chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 with me for just a moment. First Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to read verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. Even though they go through their religious ceremonies and they think that they are worshiping the God of heaven. They are not. They're worshiping a devil. When the children of, when the Israelites came across, came across the Red Sea and decided to build a, that calf while Moses was up on the mountain, and they decided that that calf was representative of Jehovah, Jehovah didn't agree with them. They were not worshiping Jehovah like they thought they were. They were worshiping a devil. And if you worship God in anything other than spirit and truth, well, then you're doing the same thing. And you don't know what it is. Just like the Samaritan woman at the well. Now let's look at another passage over in Galatians chapter 1. Verses 6 through 8. Paul had the same problem with the Galatians that he had with those folks in Corinth. He says in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And that is a tross, another of a different kind, which is not another. Another gospel, which is not another. What in the world does that mean? Well, the Second, another there, which is not another, is a loss. So, he marvels that they have, have moved from a gospel to a, another gospel of a different kind, which is not a gospel of the kind that he had taught. That's what another, not, of a, not another, is actually saying. But there would be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul doesn't take this kindly. A man that is teaching a gospel contrary to the Bible Paul says should be accursed. And he doesn't even care if it's an angel from heaven that does it. So we have, we know that we have this other gospel out there. That there is another Jesus out there. That there is another spirit out there. We know that Satan has been trying to destroy God's church from the very, very beginning. These are facts that we're well aware of. Let's not forget that in the beginning of the New Testament church age, Satan first tried to persecute the church out of, out of existence. Didn't work. Flat out didn't work. Made the church stronger. So he did drop back five yards and decided to punt. Change his scheme. Got to try something different because the persecution route ain't working. So he changed tactics, and started to counterfeit the church. 
That was his next move. A couple of weeks ago, I, I stood before you and I had that little trail of blood book with the little chart in the back. And that little, that little chart goes from the first century all the way up until the time that, that the book was written, sometime in the 1800s. And it shows all of the different names that churches went by that stood against Roman Catholicism all the way down through history. It's, it's an interesting little book. Um, you think about the, think about the Roman Catholic Church. That's the, that's the biggest example here. Um, anybody know when it came into existence? 325 AD under Emperor Constantine, okay? What was here in 125 AD and 225 AD? What was here in 50 AD? 325 years has gone by and all we have in the world are a bunch of independent churches like the one you're sitting in today scattered all over the Roman Empire. Emperor Constantine decides, being the good politician that he is, and realizing that paganism is on its way out and that Christianity is overrunning the world, I better, I better get smart here and I better smarten up and become one of those guys. So he started a church called the Roman Catholic Church. He invited all of the bishops from all the independent churches that were out there. He got a bare majority of them to show up. And then he got a bare majority of that to vote in favor of this monstrosity that he came up with. And that's how the Roman Catholic Church came into existence. And then the first item of business was to declare all those other independent churches that didn't join in with us, they're heretics from this point forward go out there and kill them, which they did during the Dark Ages. Then we have what's known as the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation happened in the, in the 14, 1500s, maybe all the way into the 1600s. And out of that, you got a whole bunch of different versions of the Roman Catholic Church. Folks, every one of those guys was a Roman Catholic priest not one of them ever turned their back on Rome. They didn't disagree with Rome's doctrine. They disagreed with Rome's practices of indulgences and selling your way into heaven and a bunch of other stuff that was going on. But the, but the doctrine, Lutherans, they, they call it something different, but they practice transubstantiation. They just have a different name for it. That's all. They follow the same nonsensical stuff that the Romans did. The, the Protestant Reformation was not a reformation of Christianity. The Protestant Reformation was a reformation of the Roman Catholic Church. That's why we are not Protestants. We have never looked at the Roman Catholic Church as being the true church. As far as we're concerned, she was always a whore. She was a whore when she, got her, when she came into existence, and she will die as one, as you'll read when you get to Revelation and, and look at Mystery Babylon, the, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots. See, she's got a bunch of babies, and they're called Presbyterian and Lutheran and Episcopalian, and on and on and on and on it goes, okay? So that was the, the way that Satan did this. All he's got to do is get one corrupt pope. You just corrupted all of those churches. Get one corrupt guy at the top of the Presbyterian chain and you corrupted them all. And so while I understand that there are some of God's children trapped in those things, and I understand that some of these people sincerely want to worship the God of heaven. They are sincerely wrong. And it's just that simple. Now, 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, we read, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, uh, I'm sorry, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What do the scriptures say about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? What do they say? Because the Jesus that you worship better line up with those scriptures. In every way, he should match what the Bible teaches about him. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21, we're told that, he, that the resurrection was the third day. Friday, Saturday, maybe, part of Friday, in three days. Well, that ain't going to work. That, you find that in Matthew 26, 59, and in John 2, 18 and 21, in three days. Friday, so Saturday, Sunday, Monday? That doesn't work. And then in Matthew 27, 62, after three days. You see, a Friday crucifixion and a Sunday morning resurrection do not add up to what the scriptures teach. They just simply don't. You can't get it to fit in there. Now, I get that there's a Sabbath that starts Friday night at sundown. And so, if it were on Friday, you'd have to get him off the cross. I'm going to show you something else, though, that most people just don't, they just ignore it. But before that, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 12. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees kept trying to get Jesus to condemn himself by stating that he was in fact the Messiah. If, the, if they could get him to just come out and plainly say it, then they could charge him with blasphemy and get rid of him. Okay? And in Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 38, then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Three days and three nights. Now, if you go back to Jonah, you will find that that's exactly how long he was in the whale's belly. Three days and three nights, that's 72 hours. And there is no way that you can squeeze 72 hours out of Friday at 6 p.m. roughly, and Sunday morning at 6 p.m. You get, you get about half of that, but you can't get 72 hours out of that. And that's the only sign that Jesus ever gave that he was the Messiah, the sign of the prophet Jonas. So any Jesus Christ that died on Friday and rose on Sunday morning is not the same Jesus Christ that gave the sign of three days and three nights by the prophet Jonah. It's another Jesus. It's a devil.
Now, let's look at the timeline of the events surrounding the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. Something we have to remember, and that is that we're dealing with two different time frames here. We've got Jewish time and we've got Roman time. The Jews calculated time differently than the Romans do. So you have to remember some of these, some of these things are given in, in, the, in the Roman sense and some are given in the Jewish sense. It's, it's not hard to follow once you understand how they work. God's arrangement was, well, it, we're, we're told over in, back in Genesis chapter 1 at the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 5 says, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. God calculates time evening first. Sundown to sundown. So the evening portion, in other words, the calendar changes at 6 o'clock p.m. at night to a different day. Roman time is what we live under. The clock changes at midnight, right? So today is what? Today's the 31st of March. Um, if on a Roman calendar, it will be April 1st when the clock strikes 12 midnight. Jewish time, it will be April 1st at 6 o'clock this evening. Okay? So we need to understand that. The calendar changes at a different time. And in Jewish time, the day comes after the night. The night comes first. So the calendar changes in Jewish time frame at sundown or 6 o'clock. We usually use the term 6 o'clock for that. Um, we read in the Gospels, especially with the, with the, the section on the crucifixion, we, we read about things happening at the, at the third hour of the day or the sixth hour of the day. Jesus died at the ninth hour of the day. That's a Jewish reckoning. And the day begins when? 6 a.m., right? Night starts at 6 p.m., day starts at 6 a.m., so the third hour of the day in Jewish reckoning is 9 o'clock to us. The ninth hour would be 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The twelfth hour, you just change a day because you just hit 6 o'clock at night again. So I, I realize that it, it, it's a little bit confusing, but... But once you kind of have a grasp of it, you'll be able to tell when you're reading through these things which, which reckoning we're dealing with. Now, Jesus ate the Passover with his disciples on the evening of the 14th of Nisan, according to the Jewish reckoning, which is the evening of the 13th, according to Roman reckoning. You follow that? Remember, since it's evening, the calendar has changed. Roman calendar won't change until midnight. So Roman calendar says it's still the 13th, where the Jewish calendar says it's the 14th. And it will continue to be the 14th all the way through the crucifixion until 6 o'clock the next day when it becomes the 15th, which is when Christ has to get down off the cross and, and they have to be done, done with that because the day changes, okay? Now, this is something that's laid out in the law. Back in Exodus chapter 12, Verses 6 through 8, talking about the Passover. And you should, 
In verse 5, it talks about your lamb being without blemish, a male of the first year. Verse 6, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two door. door in, in, that's, the, that's Passover. And we know that Jesus Christ was the Passover on the 14th day of the month. And that month is Nisan. Right? That's when he ate Passover. That's the day that he as the Lamb of God was killed, according to Jewish, well, actually, according to Jewish and Roman reckoning. It was the 14th in both cases. Um, look at Matthew 26. Beginning at verse 17. Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man and say unto him, thy, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. This is the first day of the feast. Again, this is that 14th day of the Jewish month, Nisan. So, we know that's when he ate the Passover. We know that's when he instituted the Lord's Supper. We know that he then went out with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. Went through that ordeal, if you will. We know that that was the time that Judas um, betrayed him came to him in the garden, kissed him probably on the cheek, I guess. I don't know. And then they took Jesus away. Now this is in, at the nighttime, right? So then you have the, the mock trials and all the rest of that stuff. And he was, the crucifixion finally began at 9 a.m. the next morning. Um, which would be Wednesday, the 14th day of Nisan. You can look at your chart and, you'll, and you'll, you'll see when the crucifixion actually began. Not Friday, it began on Wednesday. We're told in Mark chapter 15, Verse 25, and it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Remember, third hour starting 6, 7, 8, 9, so we know at 9 o'clock is when the crucifixion began. He was buried hurriedly as the preparation day ended, and the, and the high Sabbath day was a, about to begin. It, it comes on at, at sundown, um, rough, roughly 6 o'clock. And that, would, that was, again, on the 14th. The calendar changes to the 15th by Jewish reckoning once the sun goes down. Okay? Mark 15, look at verses uh, 42 and 43. And now when even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath... Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came in, in uh, boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. You say, oh, wait a minute. It was the Sabbath. It couldn't have been on Wednesday. It had to be on Friday. Everybody knows the Sabbath is Friday at sundown, and here we're told right now, we've, we've got to get the body down because the Sabbath is approaching. I'll have an answer for you in just a couple of minutes. So he was buried hurriedly. We'll look at this one other verse real quick. It might be, might be, might be getting ahead of myself, but. John 9, 
13. This is John's account. In John chapter 19, beginning at verse 40, we're talking about Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And it's, then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new sepulcher wherein never, uh, was never man laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Again, they've got to get this over with. Now, the matter of the Jews to bury. Let me, let me dispel something else that you'll probably see floating around the internet, that nonsense of this shroud of Tehran, or, or whatever in the world it is. The manner of the Jews to bury, they got it from the Egyptians. Remember all those years that they lived in Egypt? That's where they learned how to bury bodies. So you would take linen cloth and you would wrap the body all the way up to the, all the, way up to the head, from the foot to the head. And then you would apply myrrh and aloe, which is like a paste guacamole, maybe, something. But it's sticky, never really completely hardens, but you wrap that. Then you wrap another layer of linen. Then you put more paste on, then more linen, then more paste, then more linen, until you run out of paste and linen. Then you do the head. After you've done the rest of the body, then you do the head, okay? Now, when this stuff starts to dry, it never completely dries like concrete, but it kind of gets the consistency of soft concrete. And this is important to understand. Jesus was in a cocoon. He didn't have a sheet laying over the top of him. So when he came out of that cocoon, you ended, what Peter saw laying there was an empty cocoon. Like a caterpillar had just crawled out of the end of it. Wasn't destroyed, wasn't ripped up. Jesus just vanished out from underneath it and it probably sunk down in the middle like, like something like that would. If I saw something like that, I'd believe instantaneously that a miracle happened and he'd raised from the dead. It wasn't closed, it didn't look like a rock star's hotel room where there were clothes sh shredded and scattered everywhere. No, it was an empty cocoon inside of an empty tomb. Okay, that was the manner of the Jews to bury. So realizing that that's what they saw, makes it a little more real when you understand that that's what, that's what these guys were talking. And when it talks about the napkin being over at the other, that's the part that was on his head. And again, it wasn't ripped up. The Shroud of Turin is just, I, I feel sorry for whoever it was that they used to make that thing because they had to beat the tar out of him in order to do that. But, um, but that's, that was not Jesus Christ. Okay, next point on our timeline. The women who followed Jesus, they rested Thursday, right? Crucifixion happened on Wednesday. Thursday, they rested. Before they went out and bought the spices, and all of the other things that they were going to take to the tomb on the first day of the week in order to anoint the body. How many of you people have embalming fluid in your houses? Anybody? I'm going to have to call the police if you do because you're a weirdo. We don't keep this kind of stuff around. 
You don't keep the type of spices that you're going to bury some with in your cupboards all the time. So when did the women go get the spices if this was the weekly Sabbath? And when did they prepare them because you can't work on the weekly Sabbath? There had to be a day in there somewhere where they could go to the, I don't know, the Publix or Target or wherever and buy this stuff and then prepare it. That's considered work. Can't do that on the Sabbath. And they didn't have it hanging out in their houses. Nobody does. So on Thursday, which was not the Sabbath, it was just a normal work day, they went and bought the spices and prepared them. Then they rested Friday, which was the weekly Sabbath, and went to the tomb after that was over with, right? So that's what your chart is showing. Crucifixion on Wednesday. Thursday was a Sabbath. Friday, no. Crucifixion Wednesday, Thursday, begin from Wednesday night until Thursday night is the Sabbath. You have to rest. From sundown on Thursday till sundown on Friday is a normal work day. From sundown on Friday till sundown on Saturday is another Sabbath. And then you're up to the first day of the week. Okay. Now let me make this point. Look, look over at Matthew chapter 27. We're going to begin at verse 55. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him. This is at the cross, folks. This is at the cross. Among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Jonas, and the mother of Zebedee's children. So, the women were at the cross when Christ died. So they weren't out shopping. They were in absolute shock and horror because he was hanging on a cross. That was not any time for them to go get those spices. They had to get them another time. In John chapter 19 and verse 31... There's something very telling in here about John's account. John 19, 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, parentheses, for that Sabbath day was an high day, in parentheses, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. That Sabbath day was a high day. You'd say, well, what in the world is a high day? Look at um, Leviticus chapter 23. Begin at verse 1. Leviticus 23, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the 
14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover, and on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have an holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Seven days in the seventh day is a holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work therein. The Passover was a Sabbath. On the first day and on the seventh day, and it didn't matter what day of the week it fell on. You could have more than one Sabbath in a week. Now, I would think that someone that spent most of their life in a theological seminary could figure that one out. Wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you think these doctors of the law could figure this stuff out? Do they not? They preach the law more than they preach grace. You don't think they could figure out? The Jews to this day can have more than one Sabbath in a week. Why is it so hard for people to figure that out? So Christ crucified on the preparation day. The next day was a Sabbath. It wasn't the weekly Sabbath. It was a high day Sabbath. A holy convocation. The rules apply the same. Then there was a work day in between and then another Sabbath. The weekly Sabbath. There were two Sabbaths that week. There were going to be two Sabbaths the week following as well. Because the seventh day of after the, one week after, the, the, after that Passover day, there's another one. It was not uncommon. Look at Matthew chapter 28. Now, you won't see this in your English Bible. Any of you that have a computer program, have a Bible program that has the Greek text in it, or any of you that have a Greek text at home, I want you to go look at this when you get home. Look at it in the Greek. Because in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1, it says, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to draw, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. The word Sabbath there in the Greek is plural. Now they didn't translate it as plural, but in the Greek, that is plural. In the end of the Sabbaths, two of them, one of them, the day after Christ was crucified, the other one, the weekly Sabbath beginning at sundown on Friday, and the end of these Sabbaths. And notice something else. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the sepulcher, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the wellman, Fear not ye. For I know that you seek Jesus, who was, which was crucified. He's not here. They show up at the tomb just before dawn, and he's already gone. Already gone. Not there at dawn. He didn't rise at sunrise on Easter Sunday. No. He was already risen by the time the women got there and the sun wasn't even up yet. So the women bought their spices, prepared them on the regular work day between the two Sabbaths of that week. 
which would have been Friday the 16th. Then they rested during the weekly Sabbath, which, is, which begins at sundown on Friday. That's Saturday the 17th. And then they intended to go anoint the body on Sunday morning, and he was already risen. Now, Jesus gave a sign that as he would, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so would the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He'd be in the grave for three days and three nights. So, he was laid to rest Wednesday evening. So he spent Wednesday night and Thursday. Thursday night and Friday. Friday night and Saturday. Three and three. When did he come out of the tomb? Hmm? He came out of the tomb right at sundown on Saturday night. Not Sunday morning at sunrise. And he was already risen at sunrise. Over in Luke chapter 24, we have Luke's account of what we just read about with the women. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. You see, early in the morning... He was already gone. He'd already left. Now, I want you to look at Genesis chapter 4. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 8 and verse 4. And we're talking about Noah's ark And it says in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 4, And the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. The ark rested on the seventeenth day of the seventh month. Now look at Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb. Now this is the Passover. So let me try to explain where I'm going with this. The month of Nisan is actually the seventh month in the Jewish calendar, like our July, right? July is the seventh month. Okay, so Nisan was the seventh month until they were, until the Passover was instituted in Egypt. 
And God then declared it to be their first month according to their ecclesiastical calendar. But it was the seventh month prior to that. Okay? So think July. It would be like since we have this calendar that starts in January and goes to December, the United States was the, the Declaration of Independence was written on July 4th or signed on July 4th or whatever. So it would be like us saying, okay, well, beginning now, from this point forward, July is the first month of the year to us Americans. It, it's that type of a thing. So Nissan on the calendar, it was the seventh month of the year. And the 17th day of the seven month was the day that the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. It was also the same exact day that Jesus Christ came out of the tomb. The ark signifying God saving his people from the flood. Jesus Christ signifying saving his people from their sins all took place on exactly the same day. Now, that only works, it only works if you have a crucifixion on a Wednesday, the 14th of Nisan, he being in the ground three days and three nights and raising right there at sundown on the 17th. That's the only way it works. If he comes out of the ground on Sunday morning, you just blew the whole symbology of the ark. But as long as you pay attention to what the Bible says about it, it fits like a hand in a glove. So the ark rested, thus finishing the salvation of Noah's family on the same exact day that Jesus rose from the dead, if you follow the biblical pattern. And any religious society that teaches something different relative to the crucifixion and the resurrection than what I've outlined to you this morning is teaching another Jesus and another gospel and another spirit. We need to know what the truth says, and the truth says that Jesus was in the ground three days and three nights, not a day and a half and two nights. With that, I thank you for your very kind and patient attention this morning. Let's stand and be dismissed in prayer.